Hi everyone and welcome. Ken Woods, Artistic Director of Colorado Mahler Fest, here to share a few thoughts about this performance of Mahler's Fifth Symphony, which we gave in August of 2021, our return to work after the COVID-19 pandemic at Mahler Fest 34. Uh, this is always an exciting piece to perform. It's always a milestone. All Mahler symphonies are by virtue of their scale, their depth, their virtuosity, uh, but this was a special occasion for unique reasons, of course. Uh, it was such a joy to have the whole orchestra back together again after two years apart, and you could feel a tremendous sense of commitment, excitement, and esprit de corps amongst the entire orchestra throughout the week. For almost all of us, it was the first time to play in a really large orchestra in a really long time. And Mahler uses the orchestra with more imagination, more virtuosity, and uh, more sheer thrill than just about any composer I can think of. But this piece is much more than a concerto for orchestra, although in some ways it is a concerto for orchestra. It's one of the most groundbreaking and visionary works of the early 20th century. Mahler entering a whole new world of compositional technique after his first four symphonies. One that's darker, one that's more ambivalent, one that's more complex and contrapuntal. And it's also a work that is somewhat ambivalent in its outlook. It's not simply striving towards a happy ending, but a realistic one. And uh, for a piece that begins with tremendous tragedy and loss, a happy ending has got to be tempered by the realities of life. And so it is in this work. From a performer's point of view, Mahler adds new challenges in this piece, challenges for the conductor, which there are always many in his pieces. And uh, some of these have to do with his newly refined way of putting the text on paper. In the course of conducting his earlier symphonies over and over again, and his extensive experience conducting that, uh, the work of other composers, he's gone further in the Fifth Symphony than any of his earlier pieces in specifying things beyond the scope of normal notation. In particular, there's a quite a few places in the symphony where he gives us very detailed instruction about how to stylize the rhythm of the music. Uh, for instance, the trumpet fanfare at the beginning, but there are others throughout the piece. This is also one of the very few things that we have a recording of Mahler playing on the piano, the first movement of this symphony. And that combination of some instructions about uh, how rhythms might be stylized with the actual chance to hear Mahler play the music is fascinating because his approach is far from simplistically incorporating those stylistic suggestions. Uh, he plays with tremendous flexibility and freedom. And when he has the same uh, rhythmic pattern happening, say three, four, five times in a row, each time he tweaks the rhythm a little bit so in a dotted rhythm, he might play it very sharply, di ya da, and then play it more deliberately, di da 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 da. Uh, and it's always with imagination and fantasy and flexibility. There's so much in his playing that goes beyond what you could simply put down on the page. And so we've tried to the extent that we can as mere mortals in a big orchestra rather than a single pianist to incorporate some of that sense of flexibility, rubato, freedom, imagination in the complete performance of the work. A complete performance of this work is also a challenge for endurance, for stamina, both physical and emotional. The first two movements of the symphony are as violent and dark and draining as anything I can think of. So it's important for us as performers when we get to the end of the second movement of the symphony to really take a break and reset. In the case of this performance, I think we even tuned between the second and third movements. Uh, that gives a chance for your solo horn player to uh, reboot their computer, so to speak, and for everyone to prepare for this very intricate and involved scherzo. The scherzo is a very unique thing. It's unusual to have a dance movement of such scale. The only thing I can really compare it to is the huge scherzo in Brahms' second piano concerto, uh, in the sense that it's not just that it's big in its own terms, but it's big relative to the rest of the piece. Um, and where dance movements 
are typically ones that are a little bit lighter, and this is true in Mahler's music too. Um, this one is anything but light, and uh, again, it ends pretty darkly uh, with a musical depiction of the narrator of a poem uh, descending into hell itself. So again, after the scherzo, take time, reset, collect your thoughts, and then embark on the adagio. Uh, Mahler's big concern in this symphony is that conductors would take the scherzo, the third movement, too fast. Right at the beginning, he says, not too fast. That's an interesting one because uh, in recent times, everyone has been worried that the adagio should be taken not too slow, but that's not what Mahler asks for. He says, sehr langsam, very slow, molto adagio. He underlines the word molto, but this isn't a movement that should sit around the adagietto. And so in our performance, we try to really take to heart Mahler's many instructions to move the music forward, to drive it forward, to have it be more flowing, so that there's a sort of arc of tempo throughout the course of the Adagietto, as this sort of very meditative opening gives way to a passionate middle section and then returns to, again, a, a slower, deeper apotheosis at the end. And just as it's important to have a good breather between the second and third movement and the third and fourth movement, I think it's equally important to really make sure that the Adagietto leads directly into the finale uh, the finale opens with this very fascinating short little introduction, which is full of changes of tempo and mood. It quotes from one of Mahler's songs called In Praise of Lofty Intellect, which will return in various guises throughout the movement. And this is a very humorous song in which a donkey or an ass is asked to judge a singing competition. Um, so for a composer, I think this is a very ironic statement to make. And then the finale is also full of musical references to the Adagietto, but where the Adagietto is so sincere and heartfelt. Here, these are maybe flirtatious, but also funny, cheeky, uh, frivolous. So it's not that we have triumphed over the adversity of the first half, but that life just sort of goes on. And uh, coming out of a year in which there's been so much tragedy and loss and setback, um, this is probably closer to our reality than a Beethovenian apotheosis where all the problems of the world are solved simply by refusing to give up. Um, happy times come, but they don't wash away the memories of the past. And so as we reach the end of this symphony, uh, some of the last touches of the, the work incorporate the use of the whole tone scale. Uh, one that's neither major nor minor, neither happy nor sad. Uh, it's as if Mahler is saying, well, is it all just a big cosmic joke or have we really solved some problems here today? And for me, that's incredibly modern and forward-looking and true to life. So I hope you enjoy this performance. And remember, we are always concerned with keeping the festival growing for the future, improving in quality and scope. And so if you are able to make a donation to support our work, please do so. Thank you very much.